Are you guys excited? This is a good group right here. I like this. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus real quick. Can we give him a hand offering at least? Come on. He deserves all the praise. He's the reason we're here today. Uh, we, my name is Pastor Michael. I have the honor and the privilege of being the pastor of Three Seas Church. How many of the movie Machine Preacher? So the church in that movie, I get to be the pastor of right now. So it's kind of funny, and it's, he always says, you know, Sam will come up and say, this is my pastor. And uh, I come from a whole different walk, you know, and uh, God called me there. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't say this a lot to different places, but I already feel like this, this is family. I already feel like we have a connection. So, you know, I really came there and tried to discredit Sam and what he was doing there, because I married his daughter. So I'm, I'm in there, guys. And I didn't want to go to Africa, and I really didn't care, because there's so many problems here, right? There's a lot. And I went there because I'm like, man, there's, there's money going over there. All of these things are going on. And if you get the DVD that I'm going to tell you to go buy out there, you're going to see that the feds wanted to shut us down. There's so many reasons to be shut down or that should have stopped. And I go down to Africa, and I just wanted to prove that he was wrong and it was not right and all these things were off. But I get there, and immediately we go to an orphanage. And when you pull in, the gates open, and you have, at that time, there was 187 children in South Sudan. And as soon as they seen his truck, they started yelling, Papa, Papa. And they started running to the truck and beating and smiling and crying and laughing. And kids don't lie. Kids show their emotions. And I looked at that, and it hit me, and it's changed me now for five years. Now, I'm, I'm following him. He's my leader. I'm going where he's going. We travel no matter what happens. But what I've watched in this time, what I want to tell you real quick, is that the reason I'm here is because he's never stopped. He's never stopped when he had opportunities with money, relationships, the feds, all these things. He could have stopped and walked away at any But he keeps going. He keeps giving. He keeps saving. And even right now, as we're here today, both of our wives are in Africa right now with the team. So even as we're over here, the mission is still going on. And it doesn't stop even when Sam's going to be six feet under. He's raising people up to take it on, to continue it. The legacy. Save because And we have a little bit of the uh, new documentary. We just dropped it on the ninth. We need help. I want to get this out there and into people's hands. Listen, we have problems all over the place. But nobody's helping these people down there. Nobody's helping these children. And you're going to have a time. He's going to open up the floor for questions. I want you guys to start thinking of that now. Ask questions. I want you guys to be involved in this. Come to Africa. Sow into Africa. Be part of this with us. We need your help. But I want you to know a main reason is because we're not stopping. This isn't just coming to fly by and go away. We're not going anywhere. He could have stopped and he never did. And I don't know if I would have. But I'm glad that I'm behind a man that knows who he is and that when he said yes to God, it means something. Amen? We can play that. I want you to check that out, and then Sam will be up. Sam Childers is not your typical missionary. He's a gun-toting preacher from Pennsylvania. Childers has rescued thousands of kidnapped and abused children in northern Uganda and South Sudan. They would run up to the bamboo fence and they would be shooting between the bamboo at the buildings, you know, and just shooting inside. The wanted man is Joseph Coney, charged with abducting huge numbers of children, forcing them to kill and mutilate innocent victims. In 2005, the ICC issued arrest warrants against him, but 19 years later, he still remains at large. Somebody had to pay the price. Sam did that. Sam Childers never stopped because the bad things never stop. There is only one Sam Childers. There is no one in, else like him in the world. And I said to him, I said, would you go now to get Coney in the Congo, knowing you wouldn't come back, but you would be able to take him out? He didn't even blink. He says, without a doubt, in a second. Now it's the DRC. Tell us what's happening to children in the DRC. You have ISIS there, you have Islamic State, and you have ADF. Because the mission's not done, it'll never stop until he's six feet in the ground. Those people have teamed up together. They say Joseph Coney's still alive, he's in the Congo, and now God has me in the Congo. 
you know, so hopefully we'll meet up one day. But uh, maybe I can lead him to the Lord or send him there, one or the other, huh? Praise God. How is everybody this evening? Or this afternoon? I want to say hello to everyone here. How, how many have seen the movie Machine Gun Preacher? A lot of you have seen it. You know, and everyone always says, I want to know what's true in that movie and what's not true in that movie. You know, there was a very big lie in the movie. Very big lie, okay? Did you all figure it out? I'm better looking than Gerard Butler. <clears throat> you know, I was, at a, I was at a movie premiere and Gerard Butler was there that night. And I said that. So after the movie, he says, why do you always say you're better looking than me? I said, you wanted to be me. I didn't want to be you. <clears throat> but anyways, I want to share a little bit here about how the work got started. And really what kind of really made it famous was I was the most likely never to succeed in life. <clears throat> I want to tell you, if you have a, a child here today that has gone off the and you're worried about him or her, if you have a grandson or a granddaughter that has went off the wrong way and they're into drugs and, I mean, really living an awful life, don't stop praying. See, I was born in a family <clears throat> that both mom and dad was born again Christians. I love to talk about my mom. My mom only sinned three times in her whole life when she gave birth to me and my two brothers. <clears throat> my mom was an amazing woman, and, and, but she never stopped praying, no matter how much trouble I got into, and she would always hold me up in prayer. Now recently, how many follow me on Facebook? We're going to have an altar call for the rest of you. <laughs> but anyways, start to follow me on Facebook last week. I spent a couple days down at the Billy Graham's, uh, Billy Graham's home last week. He was like a legend to me. And what's so crazy is Billy Graham's grandson that was named after him, his name is Graham. He come to my motorcycle event this year. <clears throat> He's been wanting to meet me for years, but let me give you a little bit of history. There was a girl between me and, me and my brother, George. My sister died. My mom had a nervous breakdown. My dad was living in uh, uh, Grand Rapids, Minnesota. <clears throat> the Billy Graham's office at that time, we're talking 64, 65 years plus uh, years ago, the office of Billy Graham was in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So Billy Graham was preaching in a place. My, my dad took my mom there. Billy Graham laid hands on my mom, prayed for her. A day or two later, she come out of her depression she was in. Then about a year later, she went to another Billy Graham crusade. And one of his preachers came up and prophesied over her that the, uh, she was going to have another child and he was going to be a preacher. Then she gets pregnant with me, and while I was in the womb, another minister prophesied over her, <clears throat> said the son that she was carrying, in fact, they didn't do these gender tests and all that, said that the son that she was carrying was going to be a preacher. Then when I was about four or five years old, another preacher prophesied when I was standing beside her, thank you, when I was standing beside of her, that, uh, that I was going to be a preacher. But then at 11 years old, everything went crazy. At 11 years old, I started to walk away from God. Started doing drugs, started drinking, and I know how can that happen when both dead in. It can happen so simple. All we got to do is turn our back for a moment. <clears throat> By the time I was 13, I was pretty heavy into drugs. On my 15th birthday, I moved out of my home. But what happened was my mom never stopped praying. And every time she would see me, she wouldn't preach to me. She wouldn't quote scriptures to me. All she would ever say is, I'm still praying for you. 
She could visit with me for an hour. She could visit with me for two hours. She would bring me dinner over to my drug pads that I was living in. And she would never preach to everybody there. She loved on everybody there. You know, sometimes we think if we're going to win someone to the Lord, we've got to quote John 3.16 and shout at them about their sin. You don't have to tell anybody about sin in their life. Every person that has sin in their life, they already know it. All you got to do is love on them, and when you get ready to leave, say, I'm going to pray for you. That's what my mom did. She never gave up. <clears throat> so anyways, when I gave my life to the Lord, things started to spin all different kinds of ways. June of 1992, I walked into a church, and I said, God, here I am. And that night when I walked into that church, I mean, it was the first time I was in a church. I was a drug dealer, heroin addict. I mean, I was the worst of the worst. Rode with motorcycle clubs. I was a total scum of the earth bad guy. But when I walked into that church, something happened. But I got a taste of Jesus Christ. I just got a taste of Him. And I wanted more. See, I believe if you only get a taste... You really want more. So the very next night I went back, they were having a revival meeting. So I went back and all I wanted, I was tired of listening to the preacher. Come on. Sometimes preachers don't know when to shut up. You all know what I'm saying? Come on, say amen. They just keep going on and on and on. <clears throat> so I just wanted the altar call. I wanted him to lay hands on me. I wanted him to pray for me. So finally, this preacher does the altar call. I jumped right up. I was the first one to get up. I gave everyone a mean look. That means don't get in front of me. I mean, I want it all. All for myself. So when I jumped up there that day, I was the first one and he started to pray for me. And he prayed a little bit and then he stops. And he looks at me really weird and he starts to prophesy over me. He starts telling me I'm going to Africa. I'm thinking in my mind, I ain't going to Africa. I'm a white man. Why would I go to Africa? That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. He starts telling me I'm going to be in a war. I'm thinking I'm already married. I ain't getting in another war. This preacher wouldn't shut up. So, you know, I'm thinking in my head, I'm going to have to beat this preacher up. I mean, I just got saved, okay? I was a pretty wild guy, but I had enough morals. I wasn't going to beat him up in the church. So I went outside. This is a true story. <clears throat> I went outside and I waited and I waited. Preacher. Finally, he comes walking through the door. I start cussing him out. I start telling him, don't you tell me I'm going to Africa. And how many of you ever got mad at your preacher? Come on. You ever get mad at your preacher? You get mad at your preacher, what do they do? <laughs> they all do the same thing. They get a smile on their face. I mean, I got angry at my preacher. I'm cussing him out. He's a big smile. And you know, they all say the same thing. I think they learn it in preacher school. You get mad at your preacher and you tell him, I am not going to do that. They all say the same thing. We'll see. <laughs> I told him, I'm not going to Africa. We'll see. <clears throat> that night I went. And I laid in my bed all night long and couldn't sleep. And I cried because I knew that I was to go to Africa. I didn't want to go to Africa. <clears throat> I'm 62 years old now. That was June of 1992. By the time I went to Africa, I was in my 30s. I was a businessman. June of 1992, I knew it. 1993, I started putting off money into Africa <clears throat> but the calling didn't leave it got stronger 1994 1995 I was putting thousands into Africa 1996 it still was not enough 1997 keep in mind I was a businessman Christian born again making money if you're in business in here and you're born again and you're a Christian and you're not making money you need to have a talk with God I was making money. I owned a real estate company. I had 17 houses, 8 stores. Owned a, owned a construction company, making all kinds of money. 
1997, I said, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to give $1,000 to this African ministry to get God off my back. I come home that night, stood on my veranda of my house. This is truth. I looked up and I said, God, you seen what I done tonight, didn't you, God? God, those people are going to stop for a long time, God, because of what I did. God, you seen it. But he said something that haunted me for months. He said, I don't need your money. I need you. 1998, I got it all figured out. I'm going to trick God. <clears throat> 1998, I'm, I'm going to trick God. I'm going to go on a five-week trip to Africa. I'm going to take some money with me. I, I, I had it all planned out. Five weeks. This is long enough I can say, God, I did it. I did it, God. I'm a missionary. Now I'm back to work, God. <clears throat> you know, I tell what I'm going to tell you because I believe it happens to everybody around the world. God will open up a door for you. The last couple of years, I, sp I don't speak anywhere and not tell you this. God will open up a door for you. <clears throat> when you stand in that threshold of that doorway, the decision you make at that moment will determine your destination in life. I go into Africa. I'm only there a few days. I'm in South Sudan. And a village got raided. Hundreds of people were murdered, mainly with machetes. I had to see it. Early that morning, I heard people talking. I told some soldiers, I got to go see this. And they told me, Sam, you don't want to see it. And I said, you don't understand. I have to see it. See, I've always been kind of like Thomas. You know, they told Thomas, they said, you know, the, the father rose, rose his son from the dead. What did Thomas say? I won't believe it till I see him with my own eyes. But he even went further. He said, I won't believe it till I put my finger in the holes in his hand. <clears throat> I went to that village that day. And I'll never forget when I walked in. Grass huts, many of them were burnt. Smoking. Bodies laid everywhere. I'll watch what I say. I know we got kids here. The ground was stained with blood. I wished I would have never seen it. But the one soldier said, Sam, we got to do a recon around here. I know there's children hiding in the bush. So we started looking at children. I come across the body of a small child. May have been this high. I couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl from the waist down was gone from a landmine. I stood over that child. See, this was my door. I stood over that child. And I said, God, I'll do whatever it takes to help these people. It's been 28 years now I've been in Africa. Africa is my home. I have dual citizen. I am a full-time missionary but businessman missionary. I'm going to share with you about our work. <clears throat> At the end here tonight, you're going to have the opportunity to sow into this work. Our work is not ordinary. Well, I want you to listen close because there's big organizations out there that bring in millions, millions of dollars, 20 million, 30 million per year and don't do near the work that our organization does. <clears throat> and what's different about our organization, you can put boots on the ground. My wife is an African lady. Mike's wife and her are in Africa right now with a mission team. 
See, there's a lot of organizations. They spend millions, but you can't go put boots on the ground because they don't have projects going on 24-7. We have five different projects for children. We have Children's Home. We have the Big Orphanage <coughs> in South Sudan. We have children that we place in other people's homes. We keep them there like foster children. I like to tell people about the first feeding program we done about 18 years ago it was started and it started with about 20 people I was scared to death but see the problem with us I believe every every woman in here you have heard from God the Holy Spirit has moved on you to step out and do something and right away this is what we say okay God I'm gonna do it as soon as you give me the money <coughs> you'll probably do nothing God's not a bank. See, God's not going to get serious in your life till you get serious in His life. I started that first feeding program <coughs> with no money and about 20 children. 18 years, it never shut down one time. Today, it's over 10,000 meals a day. A lot of the children that we feed, they only eat one meal a day. That's the meal that you could be feeding them. That's all they feed. That's all they eat. Imagine that. One meal a day. You know, like Mike said, <coughs> people in Africa, they don't have what we have here. I don't want to offend anyone, okay? I don't want to offend anyone, but there's nobody in America starving. If they are, it's because they got a deadbeat mom and dad. See, people don't like to hear that. I don't know your town that you're in, but the town that I live in, Central City, Pennsylvania, Google it, it's maybe a thousand people. They got a food program. A food bank in the town. Johnstown, Pennsylvania has a soup kitchen. Six days a week it's open. Somerset, Pennsylvania, soup kitchen. People get unbelievable amounts of money from the government. They don't, we don't call it food stamps anymore because people don't want to Use the food stamps. They got like a credit card. Nobody goes hungry. But let me tell you what happens. And many of you know what, what I'm saying. I'm track, but this. In the town that I live in, people will go in the first of the month and buy steaks. And they sell them to people 25 cents on a dollar. If there's children going hungry in America, it's because the parents are using the money on drugs. And alcohol. Uh, thank God for our school systems. Our school systems now, a lot of schools, help me out here, they're giving breakfast in the morning, they're giving lunch, and they're even giving snacks to take home with you. People that we feed in Africa, the only hope they have, you can say yes, it's Jesus, but it's you working as an instrument. God in Africa is you. One of the things that we do in Africa, we drill a lot of water wells. We do an average of at least one water well per month. <clears throat> By the end of the year, the last couple years, we've been drilling over 15 water wells. Statistics, you can Google this on the internet. Statistics right now in East Africa. 1,200 children, 1,200 children die per day of diarrhea from bacteria and parasites from bad water. 1,200 children a day. You can drill a well. Sure, it's a lot of money. Our wells are wells. We don't drill nothing but a deep well. You can get on a lot of the Christian programs. I won't mention the names, but you'll hear you can drill a well for $4,000. You can drill a well for $4,500. Don't. Don't fall into that. They're shallow wells. Shallow wells in Africa. Anybody know anything about wells in here? Shallow wells in Africa are still full of parasites and bacteria. People say, well, they need to learn to boil the water. Little child don't know that. Come on, let's think about it. Little child don't know that. That's why there's over 1,200 children dying per day. The wells that we drill... 
cost us between nine and ten thousand dollars per well. <clears throat> All deep well, everything is stainless steel and galvanized, so nothing rusts up. Uh, another one of our projects is Bush's project. Now I should have had a video ready for it, but I'm going to tell you about this. Nobody, nobody in all of history in Uganda has ever had permission to do this. We go into the bush with doctors, nurses, a blood lab. We go in with medicine. We go in where there's no roads. We go on cow trails, four-wheel drive trucks. And we begin to treat children for malaria, bacteria infections, uh, simple, also large wounds. This project started about three years ago for children only. <clears throat> but because of people like you, now we treat everybody that gets in the line. Which started out one day a month, now we try to do it three days per month. Every time we go out, we treat from two to three hundred people every time. This project is saving People in the bush. Listen, we see all kinds of projects going on in Africa. I'm not saying we're the best. I'm saying we are one of the best. We go deep into the bush where there's nobody else. There's nobody there. And a lot of times, people aren't going to go there because there isn't running water. There isn't a flush toilet. You might have to go take a dump in the bush and wipe with toilet paper. Okay, that's how it is. People don't want to do it. Come on. I mean, I know missionaries. I'm a full-time missionary. Twenty. <clears throat> we have a commercial farm in northern Uganda. For the past six years, this year will be the seventh year, our main crop we give away. You know, I love to tell this. In the Word of God, and people challenge me, and they say, where does it say that? All through the Word of God. Read it. God won't give you any more than you can handle. Our farm started out at around 200 acres. Now it's over 1,200 acres in size. <clears throat> we give away the main crop every December. Last year, now this was only last year, we gave away over 65 ton of rice. Already processed rice. We gave away over 25 ton of maize flour. Already processed. We gave away... Uh, uh, drums and drums of cooking oil. Christmas time, we butchered 20 cows at Christmas time. At Christmas, I tell my herdsman, it's time to get the cows together. He already, he'll say right now, I already know. I don't want the old ones. I don't want the ones that are skinny. I want the biggest bulls I have in the pasture, and that's what we're going to butcher for the people. But last year alone, fed thousands, thousands for three to four months ration of food. You know, you hear big ministries, they'll say, oh, we just fed 50,000 people. How long? You don't hear of too many ministries three to four months. You know, a number of years ago, a number of years ago, when we were starting the second orphanage in Gulu, Uganda, I heard God say, if you're just going to build another orphanage, why don't you go home? And I didn't quite understand what he was saying. So I had to do a little bit of research and educate myself. The average orphanage in a third world country, you have to leave at 15 years old. 15 years old, you're out. Ours is 18 years old. 19, depending on how your schooling falls, then you have to go to one of our other projects that you'll hear about now. But I didn't understand why God was telling me this. Because 70% of those children at 15 years old will end up dying because they're forced into prostitution, they'll die of violent crimes, they'll die of AIDS, they'll die of other disease. And a lot of churches I go to around the world, I put the blame on the church. Churches get upset with me. Churches say, why, why would you put that blame on us? Because more than 95% of the orphanages are built by the church. What I ask the churches today, are we only concerned about these children from 
A young age, up to 15? Why aren't we concerned with giving them a future? So what we started doing, <clears throat> we started businesses. Our first business was a restaurant in Kampala, Uganda. And you know, I can talk about Americans, okay? Because I am American. I might not look like it. People say, well, you're a hillbilly. Well, listen, hillbillies can be Americans too. But you know, it, here's the thing about us Americans. When we do something and it works, all we really want is someone to say, good job. And as soon as someone pats us on the back, we're done. We're done. We did it. Look at me. You know, we'll, we'll eat that up for 20 years. Look what I did. But see, because of who I was, heroin addict, a drug addict, the most likely never to succeed in life, Sam Childers, when I do something and it works, I got to do it better. And I got to do it bigger. <clears throat> so we started this farm I was telling you about. That farm right now has about 130 employees on that farm. So then a number of years ago, about seven years, God gave me a vision of American-style truck stop. I want to challenge you here today. <clears throat> when you go home, <clears throat> don't worry about me coughing. I don't have COVID. I did when, I was, when COVID first came out. I was one of the ones that almost died. Scarred my lungs. No, I'm good. Scarred my lungs. That's why I cough like that. But anyways, God gave me a vision of a truck stop. Everybody in here, you heard of Shell. Shell's the largest company in the world. Shell has the, had the largest American-style truck stop in East Africa. Was Shell. Until my God got involved. A number of years ago, we bought 10 acres of ground. And we started a truck stop in the middle of nowhere. Now it's 70 plus acres of ground. 27 hotel rooms. <coughs> a restaurant. Two restaurants. One just local food. The other one has everything from wood-fired pizza to a steak. A supermarket, hardware store, tire shop, welding shop, auto mechanic shop. Works over 130 people also. And we're putting in a long strip mall building with nine more businesses. We're putting in a conference room about double the size of this room. That will be a church on Sunday morning. Uh, there's a pharmacy going in there, a boutique going in there, seven more hotel rooms and two more apartments. And you want to know something? It's all working. Why? Because there's one thing that we have focused. Rescuing children of war. Educating children. That's why the organization you're hearing here tonight, we built seven schools from the footer up. <clears throat> We're building right now number eight school in northern Uganda, deep in the bush. Still building, is setting on the ground right now. If you get on Facebook, you can check it out. The first week of January of next year, we start putting the steel building together. So what do we do? We rescue children, we educate children, and we teach them a skill and a trade. That's the big thing of our organization. Right now we have over 700 people on a payroll. How many organizations do you know that do that? See, our country was founded on what? In God we trust and teaching people how to work. Now we have turned into government we trust because they give us everything we need and nobody wants to work. I'm going to let you ask me some questions. <clears throat> Why I do this everywhere I go around the world. I've done 16 world tours preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, I do everything from business conferences to churches to clubhouses to preaching in bar rooms. I do it all. But everywhere I go, I let people ask me questions. And this is why I do it. At the end here, I'm going to ask you to sow into our ministry. So I believe if anybody, especially a preacher or a missionary, is asking you for money, you should be allowed to ask them any question you like. Especially about money. <clears throat> so any question about our ministry, 
any question about our nonprofit, our businesses, any personal question about me. You can ask me anything. No question will offend me, and I hope my answer won't offend you. So who's got the first question? Go ahead. We got a mic here. I think they might be recording. But thank you. So, uh, everybody hear me? So given all the things you've, you've seen and experienced, um, how do you operate in that area and not let your rage take over? <clears throat> you know, I think the one thing, I, I know the Word of God says we're all called. Am I right? We're all called. But what? Few is chosen. And so you mean to tell me God's calling everybody in this room? Yes. You mean to tell me God's calling everybody in this room, but He's only going to choose maybe a few? Yes, because there's only a few willing to stand up. See, before we stand up and when we stand up, we got to know what the cause is all about. See, the Bible will even tell us if we go into rage, we cannot complete anything. If we lose our mind, we cannot complete anything. When I first went to Africa, <clears throat> I did. I, I thought I was going to lose my mind. Children was dying. I would come back to my hometown. One man in particular would put 100000 a year into a little league ball game. And I went to him and I showed him pictures, horrible pictures, wouldn't even show you here today. Horrible pictures. And he said, well, I don't I might be over my budget for this year. That's what would put me into rage. But I learned something. It's only about what I do. See, I'm not responsible for what you do. James chapter 4, verse 17 says, if you know you should do something and not do it, you have sinned. See, I'm not responsible for your decisions. I'm not responsible for what you do. And to be honest with you, sometimes we're better off to stay home and not go hear a missionary. Sometimes just think about it. Because when we hear the story and we know it's a true story, then we become responsible for what we can do. <clears throat> right now, you don't hear of a lot of missionaries in South Sudan. Why? South Sudan right now, if you go home and you Google the top 10 most dangerous countries to visit in the world, South Sudan is number four. That's why nobody wants to go to South Sudan. We are there. Michael, Pastor Michael's wife is there right now with a team working with children, feeding children. We are not only people that send food into the battle. We are the people that's in the battle. So what I had to get in my head, I'm only responsible for what I can do. And it's hard. But once we get there, and you hold on to God, the Bible says what? Draw close to God and He'll back away from you? No, you draw close to God, He's going to draw close to you. Somebody else. Go ahead, young man there in the back. Real loud, buddy. How many people have you saved? <clears throat> you know, the government of Uganda and the government of South Sudan, and you can Google this and find it, and I'm talking over a decade ago, said that it was thousands upon thousands of people. Now, I believe... <clears throat> when you're in a country that there is no welfare assistance, there is no food bank, and when you hand pick, you know, I work with the government people in our area, the LC1 and LC2. They're like the chairman of the area. We hand pick out elderly and people that are victims of war, people with legs missing. I want to tell you something. If you would have seen it last year, my nephew was there when we handed out the food. People come on wooden crutches with legs missing. 
But the one that brought tears to your eyes was a lady crawled. Crawled for over two miles. Some of the food she left with, she crawled away with it on her back. So it's thousands. And our ministry just didn't save them out of war. <clears throat> I was telling one of our veterans, how many veterans do we have in the room tonight? All people, emergency services, police, veterans, all stand to your feet right now. Come on. If you have ever served in any emergency service, I'm talking firemen, uh, ambulance drivers, anybody, stand up. All right, let's give them all a hand. Thank you. Another question. We're only going to do a couple more. <clears throat> so I have a question I've always wanted to ask you. So when I first heard about you, I saw the movie. Um, I'm actually, before I got into preaching, I used to do MMA professionally for a bit. So your t-shirt, my preacher can beat up your preacher is kind of what drew me in <laughs> and saw the movie you know my father he was a preacher before I was always said you got to put hands to prayer um, I was so motivated you probably don't remember I'm sure I know he does I called and left a message to talk to one of your representatives you actually called we spoke briefly on the phone so I called him right afterwards and go guess who I just spoke with um, but <coughs> when I finally did what God was calling me to do and I closed down the church and went from preacher with a mic to preacher on a bike, you know, and how my family reacted. And there's even the scripture, Jesus' family thinks he's crazy. They're like, what's wrong with Jesus? He thinks he's Jesus, right? They have that whole thing. So with your family, when you started doing this, I'm curious when there was that moment, because they seem supportive in the interviews I've seen now. Is there a moment you can pinpoint where they suddenly went, this is real, he's doing it, he's not crazy, he's working for God? <coughs> I think there was that moment, and for many of you here, uh, probably don't know that me and my first wife got divorced a number of years ago, and I want to tell you something up front here right away. It wasn't over uh, her having an affair or me having an affair. We grew apart. Now, I want to tell you this. As a Christian man, if your marriage falls apart, it's your fault. So I stand here today, my marriage fell apart, and it was my fault. My biggest reason it fell apart was I could never stop. And <clears throat> there was a time that a lot of money hit our ministry. And it wasn't only my wife, it was my mother also. Said, Sam, you're still alive. It's time to stop. Okay? 11, 12 years ago, a lot of money was in the bank. Millions of dollars was coming in. And even my family said, it's time to stop. And I remember one day sitting at the breakfast table with my mom. And I started crying and I said, Mom, I can't stop. And she got up and she hugged me and she says, I was hoping I would hear you say that. You know, so listen, I want to tell you in here, it's not about making other people happy. It's about picking up your calling. You know, a lot of people, they say, oh man, it'd be so cool to be the machine gun preacher. You don't know all the grief I've went through. <clears throat> you get the movie, never stop. It's going to shock you. You don't know all the disappointments. You don't know all the failures. I want you to imagine this. 2013, I received the mother... Teresa Award for Social Justice. <clears throat> Some of you might not know what that is. It's the largest award in the world is the Mother Teresa Award for Social Justice. I was the only American to ever receive that award. My picture, it don't mean anything to me, but imagine this. On Times Square, there's a, uh, there's a big billboard it's like six stories high on a building. My picture was on that billboard for 24 hours. Every hour, I'd pull it up. Sam Childers just received the Mother Teresa Award. Imagine that. Man, that'd give you a good high. 
And six months later, the federal government raided my motorcycle shop, raided my home, knocked holes in the walls looking for whatever they were looking for, tore up every computer I had. Our ministry <coughs> took a crash dive. Donors, people that supported me, stopped supporting me because I was under a two-year federal investigation. I started selling all my man toys. I started selling land and property I had. I started selling everything I had because I wasn't going to stop. But people stopped supporting me. Two-year federal investigation. The same one Joyce Myers went through. Joyce Myers got hit for $3 million. Steve Muncy got hit for over a million dollars. It wasn't that they was doing wrong. It's what the IRS and the federal government blamed them for. And when that happens, you get a fine. The end of two years, my fine. Two years, everything was exposed of my whole life. Zero. My lawyer said, Sam, I'm going to tell you this right now. All I ask from you is don't lie. But I've had everybody try to stop me. And I'm not going to stop. And I even made it now that even the grave won't stop me. People say, how'd you do that? I got a Michael. I got an Evelina. I got a grandson, Isaiah. And I got a young wife. It ain't going to stop. There is no grave going to stop this ministry. You know, a lot of ministries <clears throat> fall to the ground when the founder dies. Because he's too stubborn to work it out before he dies. When I was 55 years old in one of the battles I was in, in South Sudan, I made up my mind that day, I am not going to let what I'm willing to die for fall apart because I'm too stubborn to fix it before I get old. 55 years old, I started fixing the whole ministry. Right now, the ministry would probably run into millions of dollars if I died. But you want to know something? The ministry will always be about saving children, educating children, and giving them a future through a skill and a trade. Somebody else, let's do two, two more questions. Two more. I got a short message. Two more. <coughs> this, this is more of a financial question. Yep. When you uh, built all this, uh, when you built your ministry, did you use debt at all, or did you cash flow everything? I'm, I'm just curious. When I first started, I was a businessman. Like I said, I had 17 houses, 8 stores, had a construction company that really made a lot of money. I, for the first two years, spent all my own money. All my own money. Went into Darfur, South Darfur, and spent over $200,000 feeding starving people. And one man actually said to me, Sam, they're still starving there. What did you complete? I fixed something I had in here. I fixed something I had in here. I can't fix the problem in Darfur, but I can fix having all that money in my pocket and doing nothing with it. So... We have had so many things that God has really done that was really, really big, for sure. Go ahead. Hold on, let's get the mic here to you. Last question here. Like a presidential uh, question, I've got 14... No, I'm kidding. Okay, my question is this. Um, you, it is a two-part. <coughs> okay, there are preachers... And there are pastors. Yeah. The multitudes followed Jesus because he was a pastor, a shepherd. He was out there with the multitudes. Yeah. They could have gone to the temple, but they didn't. My question is this. How do you communicate? What do you think pa people behind pulpits should communicate? Is it only verse by verse, chapter by chapter, word by word? Or should it be a sermon that relates what the Bible says to the everyday environment, the everyday 
situation of individuals. Right. When you're pastoring the church, yeah. you should be teaching your people. Right. So when you're, when you're building your church, you should be a little more of an evangelist. Yes. And that's why God had a five-fold ministry and talks of the five-fold ministry in the Bible. Now, everyone doesn't have that five-fold ministry. Okay? You just got what I mean? But there is a few. And who are the ones that can operate in the whole five-fold ministry? The apostle. So it's a very big question. Now, I believe that the, the pastor of a church is the one that has to feed the people. Now, I, I have brought thousands upon thousands of people to the Lord. You don't bring a, thief, a, a, a heathen or a sinner or somebody on drugs and alcohol. You don't bring them to the Lord with John 3.16. You don't do it. Okay? you got to bring them to the Lord through the love of Jesus Christ. Then, and I'm not saying a pastor can't operate like that, but I'm saying when you bring them to the church, they got to hear the Word. That's how we learn to stay out of the old things we used to do. It's through the Word. But see, just knowing the Word doesn't keep us on that straight, uh, straight and narrow track. Okay? Satan, Lucifer, knew the Word. Okay? What was his job in heaven? The worship. You know, he was, he was head of the worship. But he failed. He got thrown out. You know, so what I will tell you, we have to learn not just the Word, we've got to learn how to use the Word of God. We've got to learn how to use it. Now, I don't know your church here or anything, but a lot of people here in America, they say, well, I don't know if I believe in demons, and I don't know if I believe in demon-possessed people. I want to tell you something. Don't go to Africa, because one will jump on you and beat the tar out of you. <clears throat> My first book, you'll hear a lot of stories in there of when I dealt with witch doctors. I'll tell you one story. I come into a village in South Sudan. <clears throat> I get into the village. One of the guys come back, uh, a soldier of mine. He said, Sam, I think we better leave here tonight. I said, what's the problem? And he said, well, the witch doctors in town said they're coming to kill you. I said, I've been hearing someone's going to kill me all my life since I was a kid. And I said, tonight I'm tired. I'm going to bed. So I went into a little round hut made out of mud broken down wooden door with a grass roof went in there on my bed in the center of the place might have been that high off the floor <clears throat> put my machine gun underneath the bed put my pistol in my hand on my chest and I went to sleep a few hours later something come into my room but the door didn't open it was the worst scariest thing I've ever felt in my life and all of a sudden, I knew I needed my machine gun. So I started reaching for the machine gun. And I heard God say, you better begin to pray now. And I realized I didn't need the machine gun at that moment. See, this is when we need not just the word, but we need the whole. And I started praying. I prayed for hours and hours. Was praying in tongues. I mean, God was moving in that little mud hut. All of a sudden, I went back to sleep. Woke up that morning. I sat on the edge of my bed, and I looked down on the floor. Dirt floor was a gray circle of ash. About that wide and about an inch high. Perfect around my bed. I started crying. I said, God, what happened here tonight? What happened, God? God said, Satan come to kill you, but he could not cross the bloodline of Jesus Christ. See, I want to tell you something. If you just go to church because your grandparents went to church, you might as well not even go. If you're going to think the miracles were for 2,000 years ago, you might as well stay home. Because I want to tell you something. Jesus Christ is alive today. He is well today. 
And this gives me what I'm going to speak on to, uh, this evening. I got a short message about it's hard to be around some people. Come on, it's just hard to be around some people. You know, when I was a pastor, and I'm so glad that Pastor Mike is the pastor of the church now, because I'm done taking care of a daycare. <laughs> if you can run a daycare, you can be a pastor. But when I pastored the church, I, I would get sick before church. Because people would come in, and I made it a point, don't ever ask anybody, how you doing? I don't care how you're doing. I don't want to hear how you're doing. I don't care. It got so bad when I pastored the church, I wouldn't even come to church till I was late. I wanted to be late because before I would get to the pulpit, it's like the Holy Spirit was leaving me. And another spirit was on me, and I'm trying to fight it off because people go to church. All I can tell you is shake it off before you come into church. It's so hard to be around negative people. Come on. It's so hard to be around people. Did you ever tell somebody, yeah, I'm going to go to church. We're going to, be, uh, we're going to be listening to the machine gun preacher tonight. Why do you want to do that? That's called a negative person. There shouldn't be no point to have negative people in your life. And you want to know what I found out? Listen to this. Negative people and normal people are the same thing. I'm telling you, normal people, I don't even want to be around normal people anymore. They're all the same thing. A negative one's always saying, what if? And a normal person's always saying, why would you do that? They need to be together. And they shouldn't be in our life at all. If we want to accomplish things, they shouldn't be in our life. We need to realize that miracles can happen today. <clears throat> miracles can happen. I went up to a biker friend of mine from the club. I went up to Michigan. He has cancer and he got hospice in there with him now. And I said, well, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to pray right now. And he said, yeah, all the preachers that come here, they want to pray. And I said, but we're going to pray right now that God's going to heal you. And he looked at me and he says, it's too late. And all the other preachers didn't pray that. It is not too late till you take that last breath. I want to tell you something. God can do miracles. He has rose from the dead. Come on, we all know about He called Lazarus out. Called him by name. Why did He call him by name? Everyone would have come out. He's still in the miracle working business. If you got somebody in your life, I don't care if they're family or who they are, that want to tell you, well, you can't do that, Get a new friend. Get a new friend. Because God is a miracle working God. I can't tell you how many times people told me, I even had my board of directors when I first started in Africa. <clears throat> had my board of directors say, Sam, if you don't leave Africa, we're going to have to resign from your board. I start crying. You know, I used to be mean. Now I'm a crybaby. So I... I start crying. I said, why would you do that? When I told you God called me to Africa, you all, was, you all was encouraging me. And now you're telling me to leave. Well, when my first book come out, the first few I signed, I addressed them to my board of directors. I want to tell you something. If you are having trouble, me and Mike was talking on the way up here today. We're driving down the road. I'm getting old, and Mike's right behind me, okay? He's getting old too. So we got to stop every so often to go to the restroom. See, you ladies do it when you're young. Us men, we do it when we're old, okay? So I told Michael, I said, well, I got to go to the to I gotta go to toilet. And Michael says, hey, man, I got to go too. So we pull over at a place. I rush into the toilet because I'm older than Michael. You know, Michael got to stand outside like this, and I just run right in the toilet. I don't care nothing about him when the toilet break comes. So I run into the toilet. I come out. I go out to the truck. I see grease all over my tire. Here are the wheel bearings out. 
Now I want to tell you about negative people. I want to tell you about normal people. So Mike, I said, let's drive around back. So we got to jack this thing up and see what kind of problem we got. And as soon as I jacked it up, the tire just fell over to the side. See, negative people, normal people, would have said, God don't want us to go to that meeting today. Come on. God don't want us to go there. There must be something bad happening at that biker church. God don't want us to go there talking to those people. We ain't going. Tire fell off the rig. Time to go home. I said, we're going to fix it. Mike's like, how are we going to fix it? He don't even know what a tire iron is. <laughs> God, why would you put him in? Okay, God, I know. He's to learn something. I told him, I said, what did I say? Oh, no, I, at least he got a screwdriver for me today. So he's a little bit, uh, he's a little bit, you know, knows a little bit about tools. But anyways, we took the tire off and we drove here. See, I want to tell you something. In the world today, you will never accomplish anything in your life if you listen to your friends and family. That's why you got to hear from God. People say all the time, well, how, how do you hear from God? We believe in the Father. We believe in the Son. We believe in the Holy Spirit. More than likely, you will never hear from the Father. Because it's a loud voice that you'll probably have a heart attack and die. And it's hard for you to hear from the Son because it's usually a soft voice. And you can't shut up long enough to hear it. <clears throat> but the Holy Spirit is the one that will speak to your heart to tell you to help your neighbor, to tell you to help the man that runs out of gas or got a flat tire on your way to work. The Holy Spirit is the one that will tell you to mow, to mow your neighbor's yard because they're elderly and they're not able to mow it like they should. But see, you know what the problem is with us as Christians anymore? We don't understand the Holy Spirit. Because the first thing we say is, I can't do that! That's why you'll never hear the Son. See, let me tell you what happens. <clears throat> when you start helping people in your community, when you start helping people in your family, when you start buying a meal for the guy that's begging for money on the street that only wants to buy some heroin or drugs, you know, I don't believe in giving money out, but I'll buy a meal. That's the Holy Spirit moving in your life. And then all of a sudden, the Lord's going to say, wow. This lady, this man, they're really something. And he's going to start putting big things on you. You know why I love people to follow my Facebook? Because it's too big for Sam Childers to do. Look at the buildings. Look at the orphanages. Look at everything that's going on. I've been in over ten major battles. It, it's all on the internet. Come on, they made a movie of it. I've been ambushed over ten times. Windows shot out. Bullets through my side doors. People don't even understand why it didn't hit me. It's not like my belly's little, okay? But God is in the miracle working business. I found out. <clears throat> I found out that to be someone that's going to accomplish things in life, we have to be Add normal. We can't be normal. We've got to be somebody that's not normal. Because you have to believe. You have to believe. You know, I've got to tell you this story. There was a little girl at this market in Africa. This little girl would get on my nerves all the time at this market. She'd sit out in front of this market with a basket full of bananas. Sir, would you like to buy a banana? I don't like bananas. But I'm a Christian, so I'm going to act nice. And I'd say, honey, no, no, not today. Not today. Not today, honey. I, I, I don't want no bananas today. This went on for months. She caught me on a bad day. She 
caught me on a bad day. I know none of you ever lost your cool. Come on. But she caught me on a bad day. I get out of my car. I'm going up to the front door. And she says, sir, would you like to buy some bananas? I turned around and I told her, I told you I don't like bananas. Why you always got to ask me for bananas? And I stormed into the store. And I come out. She's standing by my truck. And she says, sir, I'm going to pray for you <laughs> that God would make you like bananas. <laughs> I bought all the bananas. <laughs> I bought every banana that little girl had. <clears throat> I want to read something here. From John chapter 14 at verse 12. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. See, I want to tell you something. If you're a Christian in here, if you're going to say that word, yes, I know Jesus, don't be afraid to lay hands on someone. Don't be afraid to pray for someone. I was in a church not long ago. I preach around the world. I preach in every church. I preached in the biggest Catholic church in the world, in Germany. Oh, it had the highest steeple. Biggest Catholic church in the world, they said. And I got to preach in there. And when I went up to the front, you know what the priest said? Let him have it. <laughs> I said, you want me to pull the gun out? He said, no, let him have it, though. Listen, miracles can happen through you. Now, we don't have to get all bent out of shape, and we don't have to start talking a bunch of stupid nonsense. But if it's in the Word of God, we can say it. It says here, <coughs> and even greater works. I'm reading this right from the Word, because I'm going to be with the Father. So what was he trying to say? What was Jesus trying to say? You don't have to bother me all the time. You know, being an evangelist can be very hard sometimes. Okay? Yeah, at the end here, we're just going to pray. I'm not going to call you up to the front. Okay? Because people will come up to the front and they'll say, Preacher, preacher please, you got to pray for me. They're going to shut my cell phone off. And, and my, my kids' and cell phone is on the same plan. Well, maybe it's a good idea then to pay the bill or get a job. People used to ask me, I can't pay my power bill. Shut the lights off. <laughs> you know the worst one that people come to me and say? They're going to shut the cable TV off. If somebody don't help me, so I figured I'd come to church. Don't come to me. There's stuff on that cable TV you shouldn't be watching anyhow. Now listen, I'm not some religious freak. I got cable TV in my place. I love Judge Judy. <laughs> Judge Judy and me are friends, okay? But come on. What happened to our prayer life? I got friends that got cancer. I got children that has addiction. Teenagers that got addictions. If we're going to pray for something, let's pray for miracles. Let's pray for saving lives. Let's pray for saving the children in our community. Michael has dealt with People with addictions for many, many years. He can't even tell you how many friends he have had OD. What are we doing for our community? You can do something because Jesus could do it. Jesus even did it. And the Word says you can do greater things than Him. <clears throat> you can ask for anything... 
Listen to this. This is where these radical, crazy Christians get this from. You can ask God for anything. All of a sudden, they're like, I, I need a new motorcycle. You get that when you get to heaven. But seriously, people start asking, start, start asking God for the stupidest things. Okay? I want a new house. I knew a guy in my area, he was so whacked out, he would go out in front of this person's house, and he'd stand out front, naming that house. In the name of Jesus, I need that house. i done that one time buying a new car, and I got the car. Payment book came with it about that thing. See, what it says here, <clears throat> you can ask for anything in my name. Can you put the name of Jesus Christ on your wants? Can you put the name of Jesus Christ on your desires? I want you to watch this documentary. I don't want to feed 10,000 people anymore. I want to do 20,000 people. I done a rescue a number of years ago. Because people say to me, Sam, you're 62 years old now. Why why you keep going into the battlefield? You don't have to do it anymore. When I done this rescue, we drove through two days through the enemy's line. Got to this old bombed out Catholic church. Village was almost flattened. As soon as we pulled up and stopped the car, these children come running out. <clears throat> and this one little boy looked up and he says, I knew you were coming. And I said, what? He said, I knew you were coming. I told them all you were coming, but they said, no, you're not coming. They said, you don't even exist. You're a myth. But he looked at me and he said, I knew you were coming. See, I can't forget that face. And you want to know something? There's thousands more waiting. And that face is there just waiting. I know he's coming. We've got to hang on, people. We've got to keep praying, but I know he's coming. Had a man say, there's no way you could have been in all them battles and not get shot. He said, you mean to tell me all these years you were never shot? I was shot once and stabbed three times in Pennsylvania. <laughs> tell me how that works. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it. God, I want to save and feed 20,000 people. God, this new year, I want to drill two wells a month. We can ask for something. Maybe we need to stop asking for our wants and our desires. I was telling someone the other day, I want you to imagine this. Take the rest of this year. <clears throat> Don't ask God for nothing. Don't ask Him for nothing. Every morning when you get up, ask Him, God, what can I do for you today? When you go to sleep, God, what would you like me to do tomorrow? I don't care if you're sick, got a fever. I don't care if you're in the hospital dying. Don't ask Him to heal you. Now I'm really talking crazy. Don't ask Him to heal you. Ask Him, God, what can I do for you today? See, you turn everything around. You don't ask for healing when you're working for the King. Ask Him for money when you're on His payroll. You don't have to ask Him for a new house when you're helping the homeless. Come on. I think when I was a kid, my mom used to call it reverse psychology. We can do the same thing serving God if we serve Him.
I was telling Michael, we got to talk a lot driving up here. I got a message I've been working on. I never know what I'm going to preach till I get to a church, but I got a message that, we, that I've been working on about how we're so unfaithful. We're so unfaithful. We're unfaithful to our family. We're unfaithful to our church. We're unfaithful to our wife. Come on. I'm not talking about going out here and committing adulteries. We're unfaithful to our wife. And the Bible tells us that we're to do what? Love our wife like... But we don't love the church no more. Come on. We don't love the church no more. Nobody wants to do anything in the church anymore unless you get paid. Oh, God, forgive me. I don't want to upset none of you, but I really don't care. I'm leaving in an hour. One hour I'm leaving. Tomorrow morning I'm headed back to Pennsylvania. It is. You didn't ask what happened to the guy who shot me. It says here, so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. I want to ask you something. And listen, there's nothing wrong with having a fishing boat. There's nothing wrong with having a camper trailer. There's nothing wrong with enjoying money that God has given you. But I've got to ask you this question here. So that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Is your life you're living today, is it bringing glory to the Almighty King? There's nothing wrong with going on vacations. There's nothing wrong with going to some fancy restaurant and enjoying. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with going on uh, a moose hunt in Maine. You're already in Maine. I like to hunt too, okay? Now if you're a vegetarian here, I really don't care. I like meat. <laughs> I shoot it, gut it, and skin it, and... Cook it and eat it. But God has something for every one of you in here. You know, we're going to start to close, but how many of you are willing to say this? God, I'll do whatever I have to do to help my community. God, I'll do whatever I have to do to help my church. <clears throat> God, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Now, you don't have to say these next few words because it could be dangerous. God, what do you want me to do? I ain't going to lie to you. I didn't want to be a missionary. God called me to the mission field. I was in my 30s. <clears throat> Successful businessman. Two years, I lost everything I had. Spent it all in the mission field. I think the craziest thing I ever did we spent over $200,000 in South Darfur. And the only thing I did was fed some people. And you want to know something? Most of those people I fed probably died. Probably starved, starved to death anyhow. But I did it. See, God has a work for everybody in here. You Christian bikers, you got some hard work in front of you. The rest of you people, I don't know your families or anything, but it's hard work to serve our community. It's hard work to serve our family. Negative people will always try to tear you down. They're always going to say, why do you do it? I told Michael, I love America, but I don't care if I even come back here anymore. 
Look at America, what we've turned into. Look at what we've turned into. Look at what many of you fought for our country. And look at what we are. So many negative people out there. You know, at least when I'm in Africa, I want you to imagine this. You pull into a village, and you're not coming in with food. You just pull into a village, and people come out of their huts running to you, bowing down, and a big smile on their face. Most of us, we have everything we need, but we're unhappy. One last story, and it'll explain to you why they're so happy. A number of years ago, I come into a village. <clears throat> People were starving in that village. People dying every day, many <clears throat> dying of starvation. See, when you get so sick that starvation takes over, disease takes over also. I come into the village and I seen it, and I had a lot of money in my pocket. I said, God, I'm going to save these people. I went back into Uganda. I rented a truck. This was years ago. Now I own the food trucks. Rented a food truck, bought all this food, Kosha, which is a cornmeal, beans, cooking oil, come back into the village. <clears throat> Did you ever see a starving person? They can't swallow. I didn't know that. I come back with all this food, and they couldn't eat it. <clears throat> the one mama said, don't worry. She was very weak. Don't worry. <clears throat> we know what to do. They started looking for pieces of hose, like a straw. And they made a porridge. And those mamas would take that uh, hose, put down their throat, take a mouthful of porridge, and spit down that hose to feed those people. That day, I really felt like I did something. Oh, God, I saved this village. And I seen an elderly lady sitting over here by a tuku. Mud hut, dirt floor, broken door. And she was sitting there, very thin, looked like she was dying, face all caved in. I said, God, I'm going to go tell her about Jesus. God, I'm going to go over there. I'm going I'm to tell her about your son, Lord. I went over there and I knelt down beside of her. And I started to speak. She started whispering to me. And I had to get right up next to her mouth to hear her. She said, he'll never leave you and he'll never forsake you. That's my Jesus. I stood up. I said, no, you, 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 you can't tell me that. How can you tell me that? How can you tell me he'll never leave you, he'll never forsake you? Look at your village. And you're telling me he's never going to leave you? That day I heard God say, you thought you saved this village, but they saved you. In a couple minutes we're going to pray. <laughs> there's anybody in here that never has accepted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, or maybe you need to rededicate your life, that's going to be our first prayer.
But if there's someone in here today that maybe you are filled with negative people all around you and you want to be strengthened to get away from all the negativity in this world and you want to do something good, that's going to be another prayer. Maybe if you're here today and you just need to be strengthened in body, maybe anxiety is tearing you apart. You know, the church is being attacked by anxiety in a fierce way. We go to the doctor. Come on. Let's be for real. We go to the doctor. I dealt with anxiety before. They give you a pill. <clears throat> All of a sudden, you're on four pills, six pills, eight pills. Jesus has a plan and a cure. <clears throat> Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with hatred. I had a man Friday night, a big, big old biker dude. I mean, I wouldn't want to meet him in an alley unless I had my machine gun. He was big and mean looking, ugly. And he come up to me crying like a baby and he says, I'm so full of hatred. I have Christians say to me all the time in churches, they'll say, I don't understand why God won't do nothing in my life. <clears throat> and I always ask them, do you have someone in your life you hate? <clears throat> See, a lot of people don't like me because I know the word. Might be the most messed up preacher you ever know, but I know the word. And the word says, if you have hatred in your heart, God will not hear your prayer. <clears throat> in about 30 seconds, we're going to pray. We're going to have people healed, delivered. Miracles is going to happen. If you need God to touch you today, <clears throat> all over here, if you want to give your life to Him, if you need a healing if you need a miracle, if you need to be delivered of hatred, if you need to be healed from anxiety, see, anxiety comes thoughts of suicide, whatever you need today, a financial miracle, whatever you need today, I'm about to pray for it, and God is about to do a miracle, but I'm going to ask you to stand to your feet right now. Come on. If you need a miracle, stand to your feet right now. Come on, all across here. Stand up. If you don't need a miracle, Pastor Mike, whatever people don't take, we're taking it all with us. Come on. We're going to load that trailer up with miracles just to get us back to Pennsylvania with five tires on it. Lost one tire coming here. We're going to go the whole way home. Maybe on one tire. The first prayer we're going to have here today, and I want to tell you, you didn't need to stand up. You could still be sitting down. Because what's about to happen here today will happen whether you're sitting or whether you're standing. So whether you're sitting or standing, the first prayer we're going to do is I call it the prayer of salvation. <clears throat> you can whisper it, you can say it out loud, or you can think it in your mind. A lot of preachers try to challenge me on this one. But the Word says Jesus answered other people's thoughts. So I'm telling you today, you can think this prayer and whisper. You can say it out loud. But Christians, it's a short prayer. I'm going to ask the Christians here. I got it here. As long as you can say it, bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I'm here today on my own free will. Asking you, Lord, to forgive me of all my sins. All the times I've walked away. All the times I didn't believe. 
I ask you now, forgive me. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> this next prayer, everybody look at me for a moment. Here we go. If I go to give you something, I don't care who you are. Here you go. Here you go. I think you've all got it. If I go to give you something, you've got to put your hand out. Am I right? I ain't got nothing to give you. I've got a bunch of stuff in the trailer, but you to buy it. <laughs> but I tell you what. I know the one that has exactly what you need. I don't care what you're searching for. I don't care what your desires are. I don't care what you're running after. He has exactly what you need. It doesn't matter if it's joy, peace, happiness. He has it all. And during this next prayer, all you have to do is that. Now, I was raised a little Pentecostal, okay? Some people want to... Both hands uh, can't do that in a biker church. Guns will fall out. But, <laughs> but, you know, all you have to do is just that. Just to let Him touch you that quick. That's it. You put up both hands, run around here, everything, okay? I'm not going to join you. i got a bad knee. But I'm telling you, all you have to do is that. See, there was a lady that pushed through a crowd just to touch the hem of a garment because she believed. You know what I wonder? How many people told her, it's not going to work. How many people told her, just slow down, take, wait your turn. She was like, there's no way. I'm going to push right here during this prayer this is all you got to do like that that quick every eye closed every head bowed oh father 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 we come to you today and we're broken father we come to you today and we're lost we come to you today and we're weak we come to you today and we're sick we come to you today and we're full of hate. We come to you today and we're totally lost. But Father, we are united in this room at this moment and we all come to you for the same thing. We just need you to touch us. Father, in the name of your Son Jesus, for the one that's here today that's hurting and lost and weak, I ask that you would heal him. For the one that's here today and full of hate, I ask that you would deliver them and fill them with your peace, love, and joy. Father, for the one that's here today that's having a hard time believing, I ask that you would show them the true life of your presence at the sound of my voice right now. Father, for the one that's here today that's dealing with cancer, I ask that a healing would come upon them right now. For the one that's dying with anxiety and fear, it must be gone in Jesus' name. Father, I'm asking you to have your way with every man, every woman, every child in this sanctuary today. I'm asking for miracles to be birthed, people to be delivered in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen. You can be seated. You know, I'm not going to put out a plea. I'm going to tell you, you heard the new documentary. Anybody here, if you know anyone with a podcast, radio, TV show, whatever, I need to push this doc documentary. I told the people earlier, you know, I had a Hollywood movie made of my life. And uh, Hollywood made the money. I never even got all my money. The first documentary, I don't even want to tell you how many was sold. Way over half a million dollars. I got 75000 
My first book, Another Man's War, was the number one seller, sold over a million copies. I got a quarter of a million. We've had 15 people since the 1st of August. The documentary that's in the truck has only come out on the 9th. We had 15 distributors call us, email us, talking with my booking agent. They want us to sign it over. I'm tired of making other people rich and not putting the lives of my children. <clears throat> I need all the help I can get. If you're on Facebook, you can buy the documentary, you can take a picture of it, send it out. I need people to buy this documentary. It's called Never Stop, the documentary. You can go to MGP, Never Stop. You can buy it on there as a download. You can get it out front here today. And it's a professional done. The, the guy that shot the movie, the documentary, shot over 200 documentaries. You'll be very shocked when you see it. One of the main guys that done a lot of the voiceover is from 700 Club, Gary Lang. There's unbelievable footage in this thing. And it is, I mean, young kids can watch it. There's nothing bad in the documentary. Now you're going to have the opportunity to help me save some more kids. And I just want you to remember one scripture here today. James 4.17 If you know you should do something and you don't do it, you have sinned. Now see what, what you have to remember. You have to only give what God speaks to you to give. See, that's pretty easy. Imagine what I have to do and Michael has to do. We have to make sure we spend it where it needs to be spent and do it. Now, a lot of you didn't ask me financial questions. The one guy asked a financial question. He didn't ask how much on a dollar actually spent in the field. <clears throat> Our audits are done. 55 cent to 68 cent on a dollar spent in the field. Now, if you know much about nonprofits, the average nonprofit is less than 15 cents on a dollar. The reason why ours spend so much in the field, I own and operate one of the top 10 security companies in East Africa. So I am a working missionary. I own a motorcycle shop. Michael's wife works there. We have a notary. We sell tags, titles. She does wills. She does everything. All the money in that motorcycle shop that's made goes to Africa. Every business you heard us talk about, everything we do in our life is Africa. That's why we can spend so much. If you're here tonight and you designate a well to be drilled, that money can't be spent for nothing else but a well. If you designate something for the Bush Kids Project, 100% of it goes. You give an offering here tonight, it goes to the ministry. But you designate money, 100%, that's where it goes. Now, if you want to write out a check, you can make it out to AOEA. Very simple. But I don't want to confusions, so just sign it, leave it blank, I'll fill it out later. <laughs> Come on, we believe in the move of the Spirit. Uh... If you are not prepared to give, you can do credit card, debit card at the trailer. Like I tell everyone, we take motorcycles, we take guns, ammo, cars, you name it, we take it. But listen, I hope God really moved on you tonight. Pastor, come on up. Thank you so much. God bless you. Before we close this out, uh, Pastor Michael, I'd like to have you come up here, please. Pastor Michael. Can you come up here, please? And Ice and Andy, can I have you guys come up here too, please? I think we need to pray for these men. And these are some of the most godly men that I know. So if you guys would come over here, we, we, we want to pray for you. Yes. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your presence here tonight. Thank you for the work and the ministry that you've put these men into. Lord, we ask an impossible task. We ask that you multiply everything for your glory. And we know that 
this costs money, this costs time, this costs heart. And I'm so grateful that I got to sit here tonight and have my heart changed. So Lord, we ask that You bless these men, bless this ministry, continue to to grow it, continue to multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, man. So, here in a second, um, Ryan, where'd you go? Over here. We don't do traditional offerings in this church. <laughs> we usually have saddlebags out back, but we're going to pass a helmet around. Um, as, as Sam said, he, he's not one for, for asking for money, but I am. And I believe in the mission and the ministry that, that we heard about tonight. Um, I can't talk about this for you guys, but I'm changed. Something inside of me changed today. He had me at, what, will I do for, what, 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 can, what can I do for you, God? <laughs> and, man, that is a dangerous question. So I'm going to ask Ryan, uh, we are going to take a love offering up for Sam. Uh, whatever you can give, please do. Uh, because, and again, everything that he does, uh, everything that we collect tonight is going to go to the mission in Africa. He has come here tonight not asking for a dime. He, he didn't charge us to come here tonight. He came here because this message is important. This ministry is important. Something he didn't talk on very much was this man puts his life in danger every day and he goes and he rescues children these children are taken from their families taken from villages and they're forced to fight they become child soldiers and sam and his organization they fix that and let him be kids again so i want to thank everybody for coming tonight uh, you guys made my heart full just being here because without you guys, this, wouldn't have, th this message wouldn't go out. Um, this documentary that he's been talking about, please invest in this. Um, he kind of gave me the backstory a little bit before and appreciate it. Thank you. This here. If you go out and see him in the trailer, he's got these. He's got them on flash drive. He's got them on DVD. Um, he's not paying me to plug these, by the way. <laughs> but again, I, I believe in what this ministry is and what this mission is. He's been doing this for almost 30 years. I can't imagine. I mean, I've been barely serving Jesus for 30 years, and ain't nobody shooting at me. <laughs> and man so I want to thank you all for coming I want to thank you guys for, for sowing into to this man and this ministry and everybody that works behind him and in behind the scenes we've got some snacks we've got beverages please go help yourselves but I want to pray for you guys before we leave Heavenly Father thank you we love you and we thank you for the presence that you've had here tonight thank you for each and every person that's come each and every person that has watched this online because we didn't tell everybody that this was being live streamed. But Lord, thank You for everyone that came. Thank You for the hearts that are changed and the people that have pointed their direction and, and repointed their direction back to You. So Lord, I ask that You bless these people tonight. I ask that You fill their hearts with love and with joy and with peace as we go our separate ways in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go have some snacks. <laughs>